As I mentioned earlier, Jesus came to give you life and give it to the full. It's a truth that he told us. And so my question for us this morning is simply this. The question is, are we living the full life Jesus wants for us? Are we living the full life Jesus wants for us? And as I was thinking about this question, one specific passage came to my mind. And it was Jeremiah 6.16. But before we look at it, I want to share with you the context of Jeremiah 6.16. The nation of Israel, specifically the tribe of Judah, has got stuck in a very nasty cycle. And the cycle simply looks like this. God would establish them, and then they would turn away from God. God would have to punish them so they would turn back, and then they would turn back, and as a result, God would establish them again. But as soon as they were established, guess what? They turned from God, he had to punish them, they would turn back, and he would establish them. They are caught in this never-ending cycle that's going on. But one thing that's always happened during the cycle, God has sent some form of punishment, but through all of the punishment, their nation has always existed. They've always had borders and lands and a place to call home. But Jeremiah comes on the scene at a very interesting time because God is getting sick of this cycle. And he's warning them that unless you get out of this cycle, something worse is going to happen. He tells them, I'm going to send you into exile if you don't change your ways. You're going to lose your actual physical land nation and you're not going to have it anymore. So it was during this time period that Jeremiah came. This hadn't happened yet. They hadn't been sent into exile, but God was saying, if you don't change something, you're going to. And this is where Jeremiah 6.16 comes in. It says this. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. Through Jeremiah, God is telling the nation of Israel, you need to look at four areas. First area that you need to look at, you need to look at now. You need to stand at the crossroads and look. You've got to take an assessment of where you're at right now in this point. The second area that he tells them to look, is he says, you need to look back. You need to ask for the ancient past. You've got to remember where you came from. Then third, he says, it's time to look ahead. He says, ask where the good way is. And then last, they need to look at their feet. Walk in it. When you find out everything that God has shown you, it's time to walk in it. And so this morning, we're going to be going through these four parts of Jeremiah 6.16 to help us look at the question, are we living the full life that Jesus has for us? But I have to let you know this. The structure of this morning is going to be a little different than what you're used to. I think that oftentimes we get way too busy in our life And we miss what God has for us because we don't take time just to stop and actually think and listen. And so this morning, we're going to provide space. We're going to create space for you and God to meet. But before we get started, I have to let you know what I believe is the best definition of what a a full life in Jesus Christ looks like. And it comes in the form of a story. There once was a man who read this passage, and he wanted to know, what does this practically look like, the abundant life that Jesus promises us? So he hired three photographers. He gave them each a week and an assignment. The assignment was simply this. Go out and capture a picture for me of what the abundant life in Jesus Christ looks like. And then at the end of the week, I want you to come back, and I will pick what I think is the best picture. So they all ran off. They got their pictures. A week passed, and they came back together. The man called the first photographer in, and he showed him a picture. It was a picture of this man standing in front of a huge house. He had six new cars, three boats, and an Olympic-sized swimming pool in the back with a water slide. Yes, in case you're wondering, it was my house. Just, (laughs) grace pays very well. And so the man looked at the picture, and he says, how is this an example of the abundant life that Jesus talks about? He said, well, look at him. He's got all of this stuff. God obviously has blessed him. 
So he said, thank you for your submission. He sent him out and he called the second photographer in. The second photographer came in. He showed him a picture. This picture was a little bit different. It was of a man standing at the head of a boardroom table. And everyone was wearing suits and ties. And they were all looking at this one person for direction. And you could tell that off in the distance, they were at the very top of a high rise. Not like high rises we have here in Roswell, like real high rises, like really tall high rises. <laughs> Need to clarify that. And so the man asked, he said, how is this an example of the abundant life that Jesus has for us? He says, look at him. He has position and he has power. That's life. He said, thanks for your submission, and he sent them out. The third photographer came in, and his picture was a little bit different. It was of a man sitting on a cement floor, with a smile on his face. But as you looked closer at the picture, you could tell that he was chained to a wall, had visible signs of being beaten, and he was behind steel bars. He was in prison. The man looked up at the photographer and he says, how is this an example of the full life that Jesus has for us? He looks him square in the eye and he says, it's simply this. This man even though he has lost everything, knows the presence and power of Jesus Christ in his life. The man looked at him and he said, that's what I was looking for. Because the abundant life that Jesus has for us is not based on circumstances or how we feel. It's knowing Jesus' presence and power in our lives. And when we have that, it might manifest itself financially. It might manifest itself in position and power. But at the core of it is that an individual knows Jesus' presence and power. This is the full life that Jesus is talking about. So as we begin, I think one of the best places to start looking is in John 1, 3 through 4. And Jesus says this. It says, through, or it says this about Jesus. Through him, Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. But listen. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Now think about this for a second. If you get a brand new smartphone, okay, and you have no clue how to work it, you've got two options. One, you can go to your grandma or grandpa, that probably doesn't know much about this, about a new cell phone. And they'll look at it, and you guys will figure out maybe how to turn it on together. Ooh, it lights up. Look, I can make a phone call. And you'll maybe get a little bit out of how to actually use these things. But if you really want to know how to use one, who do you ask? The creator. The creator. And the creator can tell you, this is what this phone does. This is how it works best. These are the things that it has. But similarly, the problem that I have, and maybe you do too, is I will look for life in all of these things. I'll look for it in finances. I will look for it in buildings, in position, in power, in all these things. All the while, Jesus is standing over here saying, I am life. I have life. But we refuse to turn to him, the owner, the creator, the one who creates life. Because we think, oh, I'm going to find life over here. Think about it. Is there any life in a dollar bill? None. Is there any life in a gas engine? None. Is there any life in a boat? None. Then why in the world do I and maybe you turn to these things to try to find life? When the one who created us and has life is standing here the whole time saying, come to me, and I want to give you a full life. So it's logical that Jesus can say, I've come to give you a full life, because he is life. He's the only one that can give it to us. Remember, a full life is knowing Jesus' presence and power, because he is life. So as we continue, I want us to take some time now to look at now. The passage simply says, stand at the crossroads and look. Have you taken time to really assess your life of where you're at 
right now. Specifically in the area of living the full life that Jesus has for you. Because it does no good to try to move forward if we have no idea where we're at right now. So in your bulletin, there's this insert. And on this insert, there's some questions that we're going to be looking at this morning. And what I'm going to encourage you to do is over the next couple minutes, I want you to look at just that first question. And the question is this. What are one or two areas in my life where I am not living the full life Jesus wants for me? And I want you to be specific. Because if we really want to see if Jesus' life can change us, we need to specifically look at certain areas of our life and be willing to say, you know what, I'm missing it there. Maybe it's in your personal relationship with God. Maybe it's in your finances. Maybe it's something in your job, your relationships. I don't know. That's between you and God. But take some time right now. Stand at the crossroads of your life and look and really ask the question, am I living this full life? And if you're not, identify one or two areas where you're not. Let's do that now. Now that we've had a little bit of time to look at where we're at, to stand at the crossroads, the next step that we need to take is we need to look back. And the reason we need to look back is because God consistently reminds the children of Israel in the Old Testament to remember what he has done for them. An example is when they crossed the Red Sea. When they crossed through the whole nation on dry ground, they were commanded by God to send one representative from each tribe to go back to the center of the Red Sea, pick up a rock, and bring it back and build a monument. And the reason they were supposed to do this is so that they could remember what God had done. And the reason why he is constantly reminding them to remember is because if we're going to have courage to move forward, we've got to be encouraged by looking back. We've got to remember, and the nation of Israel had to remember, we serve a God who is alive. He is a God who provides. He's a God who loves us. He's a God that has the best for us. Because if we're not encouraged in that, we'll never have the courage to move forward. So right now, I want to take some time and remember the full life that Jesus gave many people throughout the whole story of the Bible. God created 
man and his home the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. The Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between your offspring and hers. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his head. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your household. Rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Then God said to Noah, Behold, I establish my covenant with the you. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country to the land I will show you. And Abraham took the ram instead of his son, and offered it up as a burnt offering. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over the land of Egypt. When the child grew up, he became her son, and she named him Moses. Go into Pharaoh and say, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind. You shall have no other gods before me. And David had success in all he did. For the Lord was with him. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord said to David my he father. He took into Babylon those who had escaped the sword. So Judah was taken into exile. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many to be accounted righteous. And shall bear their iniquities. She gave birth to her firstborn son and laid him in a manger. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. While he blessed them, he parted from them, and was carried up into heaven. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them, and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about three thousand souls. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Surely I am coming soon. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Was there one story? What a glorious thing it is to get caught up in the glory. That's not me. <laughs> I don't sound that sophisticated. Was there one story that stood out to you? Because that's the bigger story of what's going on. That's the bigger story of what our living God has done and the full life that he has given human beings just like you and me from the beginning in time until the end. We need to look back at one more story. And that story is our story. I believe that at some point in everyone's life, they experience, whether it's small or big, the life that Jesus is talking about. The full life that he is talking about. And so before we can move forward, we need to look back at our own stories. And take some time and think. When have I experienced this full life that Jesus has for me? Because he created us to be in relationship with him. And he loves growing that relationship in one way or the other. So let's take some time right now. Your second question that I want you to look at is this. From my past, when have I experienced the full life Jesus has for me? 
It was maybe an event. It was maybe a moment. I don't know what it was. But take some time and think about that and write about it if you would like. But let's do that now. Now that we've taken some time to look at where we're at, we've taken some time to look back. Now it's time to look forward. And I have to let you know, this is the exciting part. I want to tell you why it's exciting. One of the best parts about my relationship with my wife is that she's alive. She's alive. I can talk to her. She talks to me. I can know her. She can know me. We do everyday life together, and it's real. It's awesome. Some of you think I'm nuts right now for even mentioning any of this, and that's okay, but the problem is, for me and maybe for you, Oftentimes, I view my relationship with God like he's dead. He's not really going to talk to me. He doesn't really care about my problems. He doesn't care what happens day in and day out. And as a result, we claim to have a relationship with God, but all the while, we act like he's dead. And so my encouragement for you is, this next part, when we get to look forward... The nation of Israel is specifically supposed to ask for the good way. Implying, guess what? He's going to show up and he is actually going to show them the good way. Why? Because he's alive. He's not just a thought or a set of rules. But he's a living God that wants to have a relationship with his people. And as a result, he speaks to them. He can speak through his word. He can speak through thoughts. He can speak through circumstances. He can speak through other people. But the bottom line is, he is alive. And if you want to have a relationship with him, you have to understand that. Because that's the best part of the relationship, is that he is alive. So for this next section, we're going to take some time. And I want you to pray a simple prayer. And the prayer is listed in your notes and up here on the screen. It's simply this. God, 
What is one specific way you want me to follow you so I can live a full life through Jesus Christ? I'm going to encourage you, pray that prayer and then be silent. Shut down what you're planning on doing after church, what you've got to do at the office later this week, anything that's going on with your kids, finances, shut it down for a minute. And let God, maybe for even the first time, enter into your life in a very real way, in whatever way he wants to, and speak to you. How do you know it's going to be him? I cannot give you a 100% guarantee this is how you know it's God. I can't. But I do know this, and I will stand on it until the day I die. He is alive, and he does speak. And when we take time to stop and actually listen, he will show up. So I'm going to encourage you now, pray that prayer, expecting that in some small way, the living God wants to actually show you where the good way is. Let's do that now. I never get sick and tired of hearing God's voice. The last area that um, the children of Israel are 
challenge then is to look at their feet. God finishes it off by saying, okay, now it's time to actually walk in this. We've looked at where you're at. We've looked at where you've come from. We look at now where you're going. Guess what? We actually have to walk in that way. And this sometimes is the most difficult and the most scary because that means we actually take steps maybe where we haven't before. And I will be the first to let you know that it can be hard. And it's not always easy. But it's worth it because in that, we experience the full life that Jesus has for us. And in just a moment, the worship team is going to come up and we're going to sing a song called Better Is One Day. And the whole context of the song is a declaration that better is one day in God's house and doing what he has called us to do than anything else. And if that's our prayer, if that's our heart, we will experience this full life. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up now. And while they're singing, I want you to look at the last question. And the last question is this. We're going to look at our feet. What are one or two practical steps God is asking me to take so I can live a full life through Jesus Christ? Whatever the step is, remember, you're taking a step in the direction for this full life. And when we are taking those steps, it's true that it's better to be one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere. So take some time right now, think about that question, and write down your answers.
towards the end of Jeremiah 6, 16. The nation of Israel is given a rock-solid promise by the living God. I want you to see what this promise is. That he promises to me and to you and to them at this time. He says that he guarantees that if they will walk in this way, they will find rest for their souls. Now think about that. The creator of heaven and earth, God Almighty, makes a promise. If there's anything you can stand on, it's that. So as you follow him, as you walk in the ways that he is calling you to, you will find rest. It doesn't say it's going to be easy, but he promises rest. He promises a full life. Sadly, I wish the passage ended there, but there's one last phrase. This is the hardest part of this passage. Because this is what God says about the nation of Israel after he has gone through this whole process with them of looking where they're at, looking back, looking forward, and looking at their feet. This is how the passage ends. But you said, the nation of Israel, we will not walk in it. They turned their back. They said, you know what, God? We don't want to. We're done. You know what happened? For the first time, the actual nation, the physical nation of Israel, was sent into exile. And they no longer had a home because they refused to walk in it. Make no mistakes, my friend. You have a life. And it's not a matter of who you're going to follow or if you're going to follow somebody. It's who you're going to follow. The sa Satan has a plan for your life. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his goal. Or you can follow Jesus. Walk in the ways that he's asking you to. And you know what? When he comes into your life, he's going to give you that overflowing, abundant life that we've talked about this morning. But the question is, what are you going to do with your life? Because he promises life and life to the full. And we can stand on this because of John 10.10 10, that says this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I told you I had good news for you this morning. The good news is that God wants you to have a full life through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the author of life. And we thank you that you want to give us this full, abundant life that we know your presence and power. So God, as you have met with us this morning, give us the strength by the power of your spirit this week to walk in the ways that you have called us to. And I pray and I thank you that the promise that we will find rest for our souls will be understood and lived in our lives regardless of circumstances. Thank you that you love us and that you want to have a powerful relationship with us. In Jesus' name, amen.